These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. Some things simply belong together in the cosmic order of the universe. Peanut butter and jelly, peanut butter and chocolate, peanut butter and banana, Gilgamesh and Enkidu. Last time we had the origin story for this dynamic duo, this deep and passionate love between brothers that could never be torn asunder. Now, we have maybe two dozen tablets of Gilgamesh stories, including the main epic, and not all of them are from the same author, the same time period, or city. And so we have evidence that there is a whole genre of the adventures of Gilgamesh and Enkidu. Perhaps the most well-attested, though, is the battle against Humbaba, lord of the cedar forest. And since it is one of the most complete, we will spend the entire episode on this particular battle. And next episode, work on reconstructing as many of the partial adventures as possible. But let's open directly where we left off last time, since this adventure in the main epic immediately follows the taming of Enkidu. Enkidu was being praised by Gilgamesh's mother, the cattle goddess Ninsun, for his strength and dependability when he had burst into tears. When questioned, he had explained that he knew what Gilgamesh had planned and he couldn't stand to be praised like this when he knew he wasn't strong or brave enough to face what he had planned. But what did Gilgamesh have planned? This is the tale of Gilgamesh and the Humbaba. Gilgamesh, mightiest of kings, called to his herald and ordered the seven gates of Uruk closed and for the people to assemble before him. While he waited for that to be done, this was a city of about 50 to 80,000 people and about three square miles, so organizing a public meeting would take a while. And so he took his fast friend Enkidu by the hand and gently led him down to one of his many, many armories. At least let me outfit you for war, dear Enkidu. And the wild man could not refuse. The smiths took Enkidu's measure, already being well familiar with their kings, and on his order cast new weapons for the expedition. They carved out huge clay blocks into the desired shapes leaving a small opening at the top to pour the bronze in, and in remarkably short order, solid bronze pieces were cast out of the clay. Massive axes inlaid with gold and bows so large they shot javelins instead of arrows, and wealthy swords that were as much artworks as they were instruments of murder. The smiths held nothing back, clearing the forge of bronze. A pair of matching axes were forged, each weighing 180 pounds. A pair of matching swords were forged, also 180 pounds, and with a full 30 pounds of that weight for gold inlay. In total, Gilgamesh and Enkidu walked out of that armory, loaded down with arms and spares for any circumstance, weighing three tons, 6,000 pounds each. Now, for reference, my car, a Kia Spectra, weighs a bit less than one and a half tons. These nine foot tall mountains of muscle carried two small cars worth of weaponry on their backs. By the time they made it to the grand meeting hall, resplendent in gilded arms and bejeweled armor, the people of Uruk had gathered, not all of them of course, but the important ones, the men mostly. And when they saw these golden giants, they fell silent in awe and terror. Gilgamesh looked out at his people and began to speak. People of Uruk, for the longest time I have been agitated, but I haven't been able to put my finger on what exactly it was that I wanted. Well, this here at my side, this is Enkidu, and in him my heart is filled. I have joy in my life again, and don't need to resort to mere hedonism to stave off my perpetual ennui. Now, of course, I'm not giving up on hedonism either. That would be no fun. But something else has struck me. Every day in our city, men die. And you see their funeral barges floating down the Euphrates River. But no matter how many corpses we send down the river, 
It never clogs, it never dams up, it never stops the flow into the afterlife. And even as tall as I am, I am not tall enough to reach heaven. And even as broad as Enkidu is, he still cannot reach over that final mountain. And so I will travel to the forest of cedars, and I will chop down the tallest cedar tree in the world, and I will fight Humbaba, guardian of the forest, and defeat him. And Enkidu, standing next to his king, interrupted him, earning a sharp glare, though Gilgamesh indulged his friend. People of Uruk, Enkidu pleaded, do not let your king do this. Humbaba the fierce must never ever be seen by mortal men. He spews water like the great flood that drowned the world. He spits blazing fire like the sun, and his breath is a poison death. He can hear the tiniest rustle of a blade of grass a thousand miles away, and controls the forest as his kingdom and his weapon. Now indeed the storm god is the mightiest being in the world, but Humbaba is second only to him. The great god Enlil himself created Humbaba to ensure the forest would always be protected. You must, you must tell Gilgamesh that what he plans is madness. Gilgamesh put his hand on Enkidu's shoulder, compassionately but with a glare that demanded silence. He turned back towards the people of his city and said, Why would I cross the seven mountains to reach Mount Lebanon? Why would I venture into the forest of cedars to cut down the world's tallest tree? Why would I choose the fiercest of beasts to battle? I choose to fight Humbaba and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. When I return with Humbaba's head, this city will know so much fame that podcasters will still be telling the story 5,000 years from now. And when I return with the wealth of the Forest of Cedars, our city will celebrate the New Year feast, not once, but twice in a row. The elders began to mull about. Opinions were divided. But then one faction spoke to Gilgamesh, saying, your valor does you much credit, young man, and none here doubt your strength. But this isn't a matter of strength. Humbaba is not like us whose life days are numbered. He does not carry weapons, but wields forces of nature, and his breath is death itself. Even if you made the absurdly long trek from Uruk here in southern Mesopotamia, to the forest of cedars on Mount Lebanon on the Mediterranean coast. Humbaba is second only to the storm god Adid in the cosmic order. Even the gods don't cross him. And Gilgamesh nodded and said, Yes, he is terrifying, and he is powerful beyond words. Should I not face him then, because I fear death? No, no, no. That would make me a coward, and to every warrior, death is preferable to dishonor. It is only by staring down death that I can surpass death to achieve everlasting fame. The elders of the town nodded. There was no stopping him now, and his motivations could not be argued against. They begged only that he be careful and he fight well, before turning to Enkidu. Enkidu, you are a man of the forest. Please go with Gilgamesh and act as his scout and companion. We are trusting you to ensure that he returns safely to Uruk. I'm not sure why anyone doubted if Enkidu would be going with Gilgamesh, seeing as they were fast friends at this point, and in any case, both were already visibly kitted out for adventure. But this might just be a case where the differing tablet fragments have different versions of the story. In any case, Gilgamesh closes out the town meeting by establishing a council of elders to act as regents in his absence, instructing them particularly to prohibit the youths from assembling in the streets because they're just going to start trouble if you let him, and to judge all things fairly, not allowing the strong to gain advantage of the weak. He apparently said this wholly without irony, and no one had the balls to call him on it. Then Gilgamesh went to the temple palace complex and prayed to the gods at length. 
Those interested in the practical rituals of the Sumerian faith can refer to some other podcast. Those uninterested should note that among the line after line of praise for now dead gods, Gilgamesh specifically requests that his grandfather Shamash the Sun send his thirteen winds to be used as weapons. But then finally, Gilgamesh and Enkidu finish the preparations and set out on the journey. After hiking twenty leagues, they stopped for lunch, and after thirty more, they camped for the night. In three days, they traveled what would take normal men seven weeks. Now between Uruk and the Forest of Cedars stood seven mountains. Don't look at Google Earth because they surely did not have Google Earth themselves. And on top of each one, Gilgamesh performed a little ritual. And he constructs a small building to sleep in every night. And then he goes to sleep and receives a prophetic dream about the upcoming battle. Each time after these dreams, he awakes shaking in fear and calls out to Enkidu. He told his friend that in this dream he saw a mountain crushing him, lightning and flames pouring around him. The daylight failed and death itself covered the land. A lion-headed Anzu bird swept across the sky and a wild bull charged madly into the fray. Gilgamesh wrestled with the mountain, battling the wild beasts of land and sky, enduring the battering of the elements on that high mountain. Finally, with the king of Uruk pinned under the mighty weight of the earth, darkness coming around from all sides to take him, the sun god Shamash held the elements off him for a brief moment, and his father, divine Lugalbanda, appeared to take the weight of the mountain, and that moment was all Gilgamesh needed. Leaping to his feet and catching the rampaging bull, square in the horns, tossing it bodily off the mountain, while at his back his faithful partner Enkidu snatched the grasping talons of the lion-headed Anzu bird and slammed it into the earth. The moment of divine favor faded, but the opportunity had been taken. He cast off the weight of the earth, and manifesting the sacred energy within him, the light slowly restored to the sky and the elements were calmed from their raging fury. And when he awoke, drained from the dream battle, he told Enkidu what had happened, and his friend brightened visibly. You have battled six of the seven auras protecting the forest of cedars and stripped them from Humbaba. He is only one left. We must hurry before he can reach the center of the forest and attack him while he is weakened. And on hearing this, Gilgamesh roared like a bull and charged up the last mountain. And Kadu followed, for despite his optimistic reading of the dream, he still thought this whole expedition was too dangerous. When Enkidu caught up to him, his friend was frozen on the ridgeline. Puzzled, he looked first to Gilgamesh, then followed his gaze forward. It was the forest of cedars, a sight neither of them had seen before. Enkidu was a child of the forest, but those were the forests of Iraq and Iran. A bit more lush than we have in modern times, but still relatively hard scrabble and threadbare. Seeing for the first time the ancient and thick forest of cedars atop Mount Lebanon left them awestruck. You could see images of the Lebanese cedars today, straight and tall and strong, and they're still impressive enough to feature on the Lebanese flag. But 5,000 years ago, Gilgamesh saw the primeval forest of cedars largely untouched by the subsequent five millennia of logging. And there above a tree line, a thousand leagues distant, a single massive god tree towered above the rest, lacking the humility that kept the other trees at a level. One normal tree overtopped even the high walls of Uruk in this forest, but the god tree challenged even the great ziggurats rising 30 stories all the way into the heavens. They looked into this deep forest and Enkidu quivered, saying, oh no, and Gilgamesh quivered and said, oh yes. Listen, Enkidu pleaded, I am from the forest. I know of the deep, dark powers of the wild. I know there is a natural order to things and that some things simply can't be defeated. 
You are from the city and have always been the biggest fish in your small pond. I don't think you properly understand the terror that awaits you here. Gilgamesh replied, My friend, why do you speak like a coward? We are on the seventh mountain, and I need your strength in this battle. One stick may be snapped in hand, but two together has real strength. In any case, I am going in there, so you are coming with me. Make ready. And they entered the forest, where the shade was pleasant and cooling. The twisted paths straightened into the heart of the trees, for they were expected, and no predator was allowed to block their way. Finally, they stood in a clearing, and Gilgamesh drew his 200-pound sword in his left hand and his 200-pound axe in his right. And Enkidu matched the king, and from the shadows of the cedars emerged Humbaba. As he emerged, the birds of the forest, like heralds, began to sing his name, and the monkeys shrieked and danced in delight, and the forest wind wafted a perfume of cedar resin in his wake. He had hands and face of a lion, and a body shaped like a man, but covered in thorny scales. His feet had vulture claws, and his head had wild bull horns. His tail and his phallus each, ending in a hissing, snapping snake's head. Being the ruler of this court of the forest, Humbaba spoke first, castigating the pair. Gilgamesh, you fool! What could have possessed you to come here? What terrible advisor told you to do this? And you, Enkidu, you are fatherless, a son of the forest. I came by to watch you grow when you were a tiny baby. I could have crushed you then, but I stayed my hand. Have you come to repay my mercy with betrayal? You betray your friend by betraying me, Enkidu. For you have delivered him here only to have his throat ripped out by my jaws. Gilgamesh looked to his companion and said in a low voice, He, he is terrifying. I, I don't know that we can do this after all. And Enkidu replied, My friend, why do you speak like a coward? We are here. It is time to do this thing. Gilgamesh took a deep breath, and as he exhaled, a soft prayer to Shamash passed his lips, and he rushed forward. In a coordinated blow, Gilgamesh and Enkidu brought down their mighty gilded great axes, and Humbaba caught each of them in a raw lion's paw. Though the ground beneath his vulture-clawed feet gave way from the force, and Mount Hermon split from Mount Lebanon, Pinned in the newly cleft valley beneath the weight of the blows, in the same instant Shamash the sun sent thirteen winds to blow hard into Humbaba. Pinned by the wind and the axe blows, Gilgamesh drew his jeweled sword and felled Humbaba, dropping him to the ground. Gilgamesh looked up at the axe held above his head and called his surrender. He promised Gilgamesh that he would give his seven auras to him if he spared his life. He would be a vassal king to Uruk and build him a mighty palace of cedar. Enkidu warned Gilgamesh not to trust him, but Gilgamesh held up his hand to stop his friend and stepped forward. Hand over your auras of power, your seven terrors. And when the lord of the forest had handed over the seventh, Gilgamesh stepped closer, as if to whisper in his ear, and punched Humbaba as hard as he could in the ear, knocking him clockwise and hogtying the stunned monster. Humbaba bared his teeth and snapped at him. Betrayer, you swore to let me go if I gave you these things. Now you have me tied up like an animal for sacrifice. Have you no honor, no dignity, no nobility in your spirit? I curse you, Enkidu, who betrayed the forest, I curse you to a horrible death. And I curse you, Gilgamesh, who betrayed his promise. I curse you to watch your only friend in this world die in agony. And Gilgamesh's heart ached for the noble and powerful king of his forest in such a reduced state. He said to Enkidu, maybe we can let him go. He still has much to offer us, 
and there are gods who favor him. He can mark our path and govern our forest. He could even carry our packs for us back to Uruk. Your pity is blinding your wisdom, Gilgamesh. If we let him go, we will never find him again. He will twist the forest paths to trap us here and destroy us utterly. And Kadu reached down to slit Humbaba's throat in a single pull of the wicked dagger. We can't leave a defeated foe here to grow stronger and plot against us, he said as he released the beast's head and allowed it to fall to the ground and roll away. With the forest king's passing, the rivers ran with blood and rain poured from the heavens. The mountains shook and Gilgamesh and Enkidu sliced open his body to remove the entrails and clean the carcass. While Enkidu cooked the wild game and mixed the head into preservative, a crash rang out in the forest as the mighty tree was felled under the same axe that slew Humbaba. Gilgamesh dragged the hundred-meter tree to the clearing and announced that he would craft a temple door from it, thirty-five meters high, twelve meters long, and a half-meter thick, a door so mighty that only a god could enter through it and he would send it down the Euphrates River to the town of Nippur for the glory of God Enlil's massive temple. And so the heroes returned to Uruk, the glory of their battle already news from the door of Enlil that had passed down the river. Humbaba's fearsome head in Gilgamesh's hand and a horde of valuable cedar wood over each of their shoulders. And in this act, Gilgamesh ensured that his fame would still be spoken of in podcasts 5,000 years hence. Now, there are three main versions that tell the story of Humbaba's defeat, and fragments of supplementary evidence and references of the tale over the centuries. And the versions diverge rather wildly, including the precise manner in which Humbaba dies, who casts the last blow, the preparations for the journey, the journey itself. I have picked and chosen on the highly scientific basis of selecting the parts I like best and embellishing where I feel appropriate, since the activity of finding the true or original tale is really a silly one. And to my mind, trying to derive deeper meaning from these stories is just fruitless. These stories were always meant to entertain. They would likely have been taken as genuine history during a certain time period, and they lived as religious tales for a time as well. But most of all, they are enjoyable stories, told to liven up a dull evening or a long caravan ride. But just because the pursuit of deeper significance is a little bit silly doesn't mean there isn't anything we can learn from this. For example, if we strip away the fantastical elements, the backdrop of this tale is a raid for lumber from the comparatively unforested Mesopotamia to the famous forests of modern-day Lebanon, which turns out to be another very, very old place named just like Uruk. And in fact, there is a version of this tale that makes it much more clear with the journey beginning with Gilgamesh taking 50 men who have no wives and no children, since he needs men to carry the wealth of long, straight trees back to Uruk but he doesn't expect most of them to survive the trip. But Gilgamesh faces down human enemies all the time. It's these natural forces of fire, storm, and even wild animals that is the threat in this story. And here we get to the matter of categories, which everyone but Gilgamesh seems to hold as absolutes. Gilgamesh is seen as being in the category of men, though at the very top of that category, while Humbaba and the forces of nature are seen as gods, a completely separate and higher category. But Gilgamesh lives at the dawn of civilization, when humanity is finally able to overcome the previously unbeatable forces of nature. Gilgamesh has three key weapons. First is the literal 6,000 pounds of actual varied weapons that he carries with him. And in some versions of the story, he has multiple battles with lesser beasts of the forest before finally getting to the boss battle. Second is the ability to construct buildings. Every night on the mountaintop, he is attacked in some version of the story, 
either metaphorically or directly, by the forces of nature, darkness, rain, lightning, but under a shelter he's safe from them. There is the gods who help him directly in the story by sending magical winds and magical aid, but from a less fantastic reading for those of us who don't believe in the literal Sumerian gods, they gave him the inner strength to carry on through a hard journey. And with the slaying of the forest king by the city king, civilization triumphs over nature. Also interesting is that even though the stories all take pains to portray him as an absolute ruler, either for good or ill, when it comes down to it, he has to speak with a city gathering or a congress of elders to discuss the matter of him leaving and the regency during his absence. And what's going on here with this sudden burst of practical governance? In our last episode, Gilgamesh was such an absolute monarch that the people were crushed under his tyranny, and now he has to justify himself before a collection of city elders. And maybe it's just a literary device, but I suspect we are getting a window here into the interaction between king and subject in ancient Mesopotamia. But you don't want to hear what I think. You want to hear what people 5,000 years ago thought. So join me next time as we look further into the adventures of Gilgamesh and Enkidu as they drop a hammer into hell, do battle with the armies of Kish, scorn the goddess Ishtar, and battle the mighty bull of heaven. Thank you for listening.